I actually was the first music theory composition major at University of Minnesota Duluth, which is then a band choir director school. Uh, so I passed around, as I did now, uh, pieces of this edition. Only lasted about five years. Publication became steadily more irregular, and then finally failed, I don't know, due to finances or lack of interest or uh, lack of submissions. I'm not sure why exactly. Perhaps the principal people involved moved on to other things. And you can kind of infer from the, uh, my remark about acquiring this used and like the Dwight's journal that I acquired used that retrospective collecting is kind of a big priority for me. We have a university that's only 40 years old. The collections uh, might be wide, but probably are not deep. And that's the case with our music collection. Now, if comparable uh, European publications at the time, this is from uh, late 60s to early 70s, uh, such as Germany's Delphia, uh, were overly pompous, and American Ivy League publications of the time, such as the Perspectives of New Music out of uh, Harvard and Yale, were hopelessly pedantic, and I use these words to hopefully stimulate argument, uh, which it did. Uh, source, whose emergence coincides with the heyday of California hippie counterculture, represented a breath of fresh air. Uh, here were serious university affiliated composers who did not always take themselves too seriously and promoted a music making that was fun and invigorating, however unusual and outrageous the circumstances. I think one of those even has John Cage's famous four minutes and 33 seconds in there somewhere. Uh, the series constitutes a vivid documentary window on five years worth of eclectic cross-disciplinary and anti-rational West Coast experimentalism in uh, what was then very controversial music and multimedia, and it gave a uh, very wide national distribution to extremist notions about artistic freedom for musical conventions, uh, not so much through dogmatic essays or blow-by-blow -blow musical analysis, which were those pompous European and East Coast publications, as much as through challenging and provocative scores and often perplexing notation on-the-spot reports and performances that often provoke the question, is this music? Uh, for example, one of the editions had a keyboard made of fur. <laughs> and you played this keyboard, and then I guess for the performer, the various sensations of, you know, I don't know, some experiment in synesthetic, and maybe you had to be smoking something. That wasn't in the instructions, but it was probably implied. Uh, but there are you know, many, many uh, very unusual and radical ideas to what constitutes a, a musical work and a performance of a musical work. Okay, maestros in action, vintage videos of eminent conductors. Uh, our music department is on track to add a Doctor of Musical Arts program in conducting and performance next fall. And so I've been seeking and acquiring DVDs that feature influential orchestra conductors in performance and especially if I can in rehearsal, this being you know, particularly valuable to young conductors to see some of the maestros not only conducting performance but actually rehearsing with a group. That's probably even more informative for them. Uh, so last summer I did a Friday afternoon at the movies program uh, of video excerpts complete with popcorn and ice cold lemonade. Did you know, come to that one? You know, <laughs> the, you know at the movies, right? So I set up popcorn and lemonade back there had about six people come. Unfortunately, after watching a passionate Toscanini in 1943 conducting Verdi's Hymn to the Nations, uh, and as we are about to switch to a very young Sarabedaki doing Beethoven's Egmont inside the bombed out ruins of Berlin's Philharmonic Hall in 1947, the electrical power to half the campus failed, so everything went out of this room. Uh, I rescheduled that and then successfully represented it last fall. And I'm going to take just a few minutes now to show uh, the Toscanini that I that I mentioned. Um, this is uh, from the middle of this Hymn to the Nations by Verdi. Verdi had comp the great Italian opera composer. Verdi had composed this work in the 1860s for some uh, multinational celebration or festival in Europe. And it, uh, he incorporated the national anthems of different European countries in, in folk music or ethnic music, uh, kind of a 
pastiche of various things uh, with the full orchestra choir and a tenor soloist uh, owed him to the nations, that kind of a thing. Uh, now, Toscanini was a that great American or the great Italian American. Oh, I guess Italian. He never renounced his Italian citizenship. He's the great conductor. Um, was a fervent Italian patriot who detested the fascists, as did many Italians in America at the time. And he performed this piece, The Hymn to the Nations, several times in 1943 as a propaganda piece. And he substituted a key phrase in the text uh, from Verdi's original text. He made it refer to Italy as betrayed. Italia mia patria traduta, something like that. And then he also added in to this pastiche the Soviet and the United States national anthems, which of course did not exist in Verdi's version. So then um, what we're going to see a little few minutes of is a propaganda film made by the U.S. Office of War Information in December 1943, after the Allies had overthrown Mussolini and Italy switched sides and now helped the Allies to drive the Nazis back up the peninsula. Uh, very emotional performance. Toscanini can be seen singing along with the words, and he's almost got tears in his eyes. Uh, so in a few, uh, for a few moments at the beginning of this excerpt, you'll also see the Westminster College Choir. So you see how clean-cut college kids looked in 1943. <laughs> our um, audio equipment, or, or video equipment, is in this closet. I can't just click on something. I have to do this. First, I have to switch over. Works right. Uh, I worked on a lot of I put all my DVD excerpts on the video. <laughs> Thank you. 